This episode is brought to you by That Gosh Darn Hippie Show. Featuring music from the days of vinyl, it's the grooviest thing to hear on your radio. Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and sweet Lucifer, I hate faith-based media. Well, duh. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, but there's a bit more going on here than professional discourtesy. A lot of the stuff aimed at Christian audiences these days is just plain bad, and it wasn't always this way. Time was the other side recruited decent talent for their PR, and every major world religion has inspired great art, timeless works that transcend individual belief systems. But somewhere around the time Focus on the Family got involved, Christian fiction devolved into a mess of sentimentality, strawmen, and heavy-handed moralizing. For example, our next offender, High Tops. This little slice of 80s Limburger is the brainchild of husband and wife team Debbie Kerner and Ernie Rotino, best known as creators of Salty the Singing Songbook. Ugh! I'm not sure how that's supposed to encourage children to believe in a loving, benevolent deity, but you do you, Rotinos. High Tops is aimed at a more adolescent crowd and deals with typical adolescent topics from the typical just-say-no-moral-guardian perspective. Reaganistic attempts to rap with the kids with an evangelical fundamentalist twist? What could possibly go wrong? Let's examine the case of High Tops and find out. We open with a Bible verse superimposed on a couple of daft punk angels, so even by Christian media standards, this is not going to be subtle. And we get a kind of opening montage of people going on about the High Tops, who are some hot singing group holding a concert that night. Heather, can I borrow your sweater to wear to the concert? Get serious, the last time you borrowed it, you had it for three months. Well, at least I gave it back and I even washed it! I'm sorry, did anyone in this cast have a theater class? Or a rehearsal? Sin number one for some very subpar acting. Anyway, this is your usual collection of high school stereotypes. Tony the clean-cut boy, Heather his clean-cut girlfriend, Ginny the mildly bad girl who wants the clean-cut boy and is envious of the clean-cut girl, Norman the nerd who dresses like no nerd has done since the 1950s, and a few other characters who aren't important enough for me to remember their names. All of them are just crazy about the high tops, and it isn't long before we get to see what the fuss is all about. And all the things giving come from It's like a high school version of Pandy and Dandy. The high tops perform the sort of bland, nondescript sound that Christian pop is built on, and their dancers are kind of like a semi-coordinated jazzercise class. But hey, what's a faith-based story without the Prince of Darkness and Father of Lies showing up to be a one-dimensional bad guy? Louis, as he's calling himself here, turns up in a red spangly jacket and is accompanied by his own electric guitar riff, so you know he's evil. I ain't half as bad as them. Holy holies make me out to be. <laughs> I'm voice. <laughs> this is perhaps the most over-the-top depiction of the boss I've ever seen, and remember, I've seen this. We fight for the spotlight. We kill for the call. Huh, at least they didn't turn your side into winged power rangers with modulated voices. Hey, Buster, I thought we told you to get off the premises. Donna, I know you have issues with this. Of course I have issues! Can you imagine what the heavenly chorus would sound like if we were going about talking like stormtroopers? Angel, I got this. Just trust me and let me do my job, okay? The High Tops lead singer, who doesn't have a name and who also didn't take part in the last song in any way, comes on to introduce the next number, which is also our next sin, the fight song. We're all soldiers of Jesus, we mustn't forget Though the battle's been won, still it's our battle yet This song is vaguely about the armor of God, which is a bit of metaphorical preaching by St. Paul that a lot of American Christians have latched onto because it sounds militaristic and cool, and because they can base superheroes off of it. It's more of the same generic upbeat pop and semi-competent dancing, but with a bit of a creepier edge. I'm gonna lay down my life and fight I'm gonna lift up my sword and shield I'm gonna stand up and sing praise God and my king Until all of my enemies yield Between the angels
angel bots and the declarations of laying down one's life, this whole thing is coming off a lot more cultish than the creators intended. I hope. Lead singer closes out the concert by giving a TED Talk explaining the meaning of the name High Tops, something about striving for one's utmost and running to God or some such faff, and sets down what will be the theme for the evening. You know, you know, it's easy to become a loser. You just follow the crowd. But if you really want to win, really, then you set the pace. Run to Jesus. So after telling the audience to avoid peer pressure by joining the largest religion in the world and the dominant cultural force in America, he announces that the High Tops are holding auditions for new band members, and all of our 20-something teenagers are eager to sing and dance badly for the opposition, including Norman. Well, I'm a typical teenager. My random access memory retains approximately 600K. <laughs> I mastered all the computer games. Really? Computers and video games? What kind of dork is into that? But this leads us into sin number three, the terrible monologues. Every so often, this show stops dead so one of the characters can go on a bit about whatever is going on in their mind and backstory, because Lord of Darkness knows their acting isn't enough to convey it. These speeches are tedious at best and painful at worst. Norman's monologue, which is all about noticing girls and personal hygiene, is as painfully unfunny as it sounds. I now use extra dry and deeper sprint. <sighs> Chlorets for fresh breath. See my green tongue? But let's get back to the most important preparation for the auditions, buying high top sneakers. Yes, this show just stopped dead for a song about shoes. Even Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark eventually realized that was a bad idea. A bad video transition takes us to heaven and Lily, Grace, and Finley, the three dopiest angels in existence, if one can measure such things. They're studying information on peer pressure stored on kaleidoscopes, but they're a little confused on the whole subject, so they ask the Archangel Gabriel for clarification. You don't have to take the time, time? out to. There's no time in eternity, Finley. That's not know? Gabriel, that's Merlin from Excalibur. Anyway, Gabriel, with a go-ahead from the man upstairs, suggests that the angels might benefit from some field study. Oh, joy! Oh, rapture! A mission! This is so exciting! I'm sorry, I will not stand for this anymore. This place representation of angel kind is absolutely insulting. Hey, we have it worse. Check out how Louie, who can totally waltz through the pearly gates whenever he likes, apparently, threatens his eternal enemies with the vindictive fury of hell. You ain't seen the last of me, toys. Ahem. Our wings? Huh, you're going to de-wing us? You mean like, one mean little boy in a box? Yeah, you win. Yay! Oh, wait. Lily gets transformed into a valley girl, cause she's Lily from the valley, get it? Grace is turned into a nerd, and Finley is transformed into a fuzzy-haired dude inexplicably called Twin Finn. And they all descend to the mortal plane, but first we get sin number four, the fad song. This song sounds like the love child of Talking Heads and Queen, only with a severe concussion. But it's the weirdly bizarre costumes that really sear it into your brain, which I guess are supposed to represent fads throughout history. Remember when all the flappers were into hula hoops and the kids dressed like... Carmen Miranda? And Elvis? And a conehead? And whoever this guy is supposed to be? And here I thought drugs were discouraged in evangelical circles. The angels descend to Earth and make friends with the human cast, and also get to experience some of the fun stuff about being human, like the common cold. Oh! Thank you! I'm eternally grateful. That was pointless. 
But Louis has also incarnated as kind of a mix between thriller-era Michael Jackson and a third-string T-Bird, and he starts in on the tempting thing by suggesting Ginny should cheat on an upcoming test. But Ginny, being as squeaky clean a bad girl as you can possibly imagine, needs some convincing, so we get what I fear is supposed to be our villain song, Don't Think About the Consequences. Don't think about the consequences. Don't think about the old routine. Don't think about the consequences. Spend it and you come out clean. Why am I not surprised that this musical equates rap with evil? This song is tedious and repetitive. The outro in particular feels like it goes on forever. And it's really where the entire enterprise dips below the high school production level. Heather protests when Ginny tries to copy answers off her, causing the teacher to punish her instead because the teacher is a bit of an asshole. Which is the first thing to ring true in this movie. She vents to Lily, who decides this is a good time to do some evangelizing. It's totally cool, Heather. You just gotta look under her grody surface and see the way she really is. Like, look at it the way God would look at it. There is a fine line between looking for the good in people and giving them the benefit of the doubt and allowing abusive assholes to walk all over you, and I don't think this show knows where it is. Or even that such a line exists. But hey, let's leave behind the cheating plot. Seriously, it will never come up again. And watch Grace meet Awkward and Dorky with Norman. Oh, forgive me. Please. This leads into sin number six, Nerds in Love. Yes, that is three sins for three songs in a row, and this one is by far the worst of the lot. I love you. I love you. And though it's just for sight, we'll take the time and make it right. The melody is awful and ungainly, the lyrics are inept, but the worst part is how much it makes fun of the weird kids who don't fit in, and how much the audience enjoys laughing at them. It doesn't feel funny, it feels mean-spirited and cruel. How is that Christian? How is that any kind of decent humanity? Elsewhere, Tony has some plants in his locker. No, not that kind, because that would be interesting. Uh, yeah. it. It's too boring. It's gonna take over the whole school. So much of this movie would be improved by Audrey too coming in to eat people. Tony and Twin Finn have a talk about Tony's relationship with Heather, and Tony reveals that the two of them are engaged to be married right after graduation. Which is totally a normal thing for a couple of high school seniors with no life skills or financial independence. The talk turns to premarital sex. Which Twin Finn, of course, is against. But Louie figures Tony's hormones are a good opening for a little temptation, and makes plans to have a chat with him later. Meanwhile, Lily and Twin Finn compare notes on what they've learned so far. You know, I think I'm beginning to understand what this peer pressure thing is all about, you know, for sure. It's all in the need to feel like you're part of the group. Really? You had to incarnate on Earth to figure that much out? Evil will always triumph. Because good is dumb. So Lily and Twin Finn turn invisible, by the way, they can totally turn invisible now, to spy on Heather and Tony as Tony proposes to celebrate their engagement at Inspiration Point. Heather resents this suggestion for all of the fear-mongering and slut-shaming reasons. I don't want to end up like Mary Lou Palmer. She's 16 years old, she has a baby, and she's stuck in one of those homes for for unwed mothers. Still, nobody in this show compares a girl to a piece of chewing gum or a rose with its petals torn off, or any of those other gross metaphors abstinence preachers trot out when equating a woman's value to her sexual purity. So, yay to that, I guess. On the other hand, we do get a big solo with overblown video effects and Heather looking pretty bored for someone defending her honor. But with you acting this way, you're out of order, so make me put our love on the line. Meanwhile, I swear this plot has the attention span of a dog in a field of squirrels. Grace breaks the bad news to Norman that their love is never meant to be, as she must soon return to the celestial sphere from which she descended. Norman is understandably upset about that, but Grace comforts him. You've been lonely and rejected all the years you've been growing up. But God will never reject you. He'll always be your friend. No, just no. 
You do not get to spend a full hour making this character the butt of every one of your jokes and then pretend you actually care about how much he's hurting inside. You don't care about him. You don't care about any of these characters, or anybody in your audience for that matter, beyond using them as potential points for your holy scorecard. Grace's the rest of the world hates you but I don't speech is the kind of thing cult recruitment is made out of. He created you as a unique individual. And he loves you. Even more than I do. Yeah, but God won't kiss me and stuff. But let's abandon that subplot, thank Lucifer, and switch over to Ginny, who's freaking out about her audition and generally giving Louie an in to play off her insecurities. Louie proposes a little drugs and alcohol to calm her down, because we're hitting all of the PSA bases here, and when that doesn't work, convinces her to sabotage Heather's audition. Didn't you hear? <laughs> they moved it up an hour. I just thought I'd save you the walk. Well, thanks. These high school musical shenanigans lead into sin number eight, I Wanna Be in the Band, which is basically the worst version of a chorus line ever, including the movie version of a chorus line. I wanna be in the band, I need to be in the band, I gotta be in the band, mister. I wanna be in the band, I need to be in the band, I gotta be in the band, mister. It's hard to tell what is worse, the chorus of the song, another piece that just keeps going like the Energizer Bunny, or the traditional Bad Auditions montage, which is just another excuse to point and laugh at people. Do you dance? Well, no! My parents couldn't afford the lessons. Then you play an instrument. No, they couldn't afford that either. Well, you were too poor for lessons. Guess God doesn't love you enough. Next! Oh, and Norman gets a sweet moving ballad lip-synced to a much better voice that is yet another desperate attempt to convince us the writers care about him. The more that I reach out to touch you The more that you push me away after a bit of all of you have unique talents sermonizing that contradicts the attitude of the montage we just saw, Tony, Ginny, and Norman all make it into high tops, but Ginny is just as quickly kicked out when her malfeasance to Heather is revealed. Ginny goes right back to Luby and instantly starts doing shots and popping pills to make herself feel better. Hey, congratulations, Ginny, on making the group! <laughs> Speak of the devil! <laughs> was almost funny. Ginny's very first experiment with controlled substances leads to an instant OD. Let that be a lesson, kids! Just as the angel trio are recalled to heaven. Heather prays for Ginny to live, because she's cared so much about her so far, and the editing gets hilariously weird. Now, if this were a chick tract, Ginny would be drop-kicked right into the inferno without passing go, but this production is aiming for something a little more upbeat, so she miraculously comes back talking about a near-death experience with the angels. And all the characters browbeat the message into us with sin number nine, the preachy ending. We don't have to clean up ourselves to go to God. That's his job. He accepts us just the way we are. As long as what we are is heterosexual, cisgender, preferably white virgins who believe the earth is 6,000 years old, and touching ourselves makes the baby Jesus cry. It's a little disconcerting to have this show pretend to be about the importance of being yourself and not giving in to peer pressure, when it ends with at least two emotionally vulnerable characters being hard-sold into accepting the opposition's kid as their lord and savior. Anyway, Tony and Heather make up and agree to leave room for the Holy Spirit this time. Ginny likes Norman now because reverse Nightingale Syndrome. Everyone sings an uplifting song, and the angels tell Gabriel what they've learned among the humans. Ooh, I like him! And here's... Yours! Yep, that's what this entire exercise was all about. Cool shoes! I just know a young new song is in the audience somewhere. High Tops is the embodiment of the phrase preaching to the choir and an example of why preaching to the choir is ineffective. It won't convince anyone who doesn't already agree with its views, in fact it might actively repulse them, and anyone who does agree with it will just come away with nothing more than a comforting reassurance of their own moral superiority to the rest of the world.
And that's not a healthy mindset, no matter what spiritual or philosophical framework you couch it in. And since this show is all about being true to yourself, the Court of Musical Hell thinks it only fitting that all those responsible be condemned to face the magic mirror gate from the never-ending story, and deal with the narrow-minded, proselytizing people that they are. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned.